what I would like to discuss today is um, <clears throat> is the mechanics of playwriting. Um, and I'm not a, um, I have never had an agent uh, because I never had a full length play produced. I've had um, three one act plays produced, um, mainly at the La Mama Experimental Dinner Theater up in, uh, in New York City in the, uh, throughout the 90s, mainly in the early 90s, but also toward the middle of the 90s. So I had one-act plays produced, but I never was able to get a full-length produced, and therefore I could never get an agent. So, and I've written many full-length plays, but um, in order to get an agent to sponsor you, uh, you must have at least a one full-length play produced, developed, workshopped, and produced, and it has a pretty, a pretty good commercial success record as well as artistic, of course. So, that's my background on that. Now, I've been writing plays since 1983. I wrote my first uh, full-length play in 1983, and I wrote screen stories before that, starting in 1980. I've composed music on the piano since 1973. And I've done short stories and stuff like that. I worked on a novel and novelas and stuff like that. So the mechanics of playwriting, um, from my own personal experience, okay, and like I said, I'm not a professional in the sense that I've never been um, produced or I never, I mean, as far as full length plays are concerned, and I've never had an agent. But from my own personal experience, um, I'm going to speak about playwriting. Playwriting is an interesting experience. Um, I haven't written a full-length play, or even a play for that matter, in about a year. But when I did, I will speak to that. Um, and it's a funny process. When you... It, and I'll, I'll explain it. Um, when you have... It's either, you're either sparked by inspiration, like some of my plays were sparked by a woman that I've met in my life, or maybe an idea, or a political idea, um, or a social idea, uh, or an issue, uh, sparked the inspiration. And once you get that inspiration going, or you want to work out an idea, in a play, you have an idea. You don't even have to be inspired. You can have an idea. Like I, when I did King of Clubs, um, and that was based on ideas I've had over the years, and then I finally put put it into a play. Um, and it's a funny process. So I'm going to speak to that process, how you initialize that, um, how you start to uh, write. Now, I believe it was Samuel Beckett that he would keep all all of the the entire play in his head, and then spontaneously, when he's finished the play in his head, he'd write everything down. He'd almost like dictate everything that he had had accumulated in his head. I, on the other hand, what I do is either do two things: either I do an outline. Of um, of the play, like I've had two plays sort of on the back burner. I've done outlines to it. I got a little dialogue, but most of it's just been on the back burner. Someday I'll write it. Maybe those two plays, or maybe I may not. I don't know. Or if you're not, um, if if you're not outlining it, then what happens is, or and sometimes you outline as you he, hear these quote-unquote voices in your head and so kind of 
it's almost like a schizophrenic kind of experience in the sense that you start to hear voices, uh, characters that start to th think or, or speak in your head. And the, you always have a conflict between the characters because the conflict, if you have really good, after a while you will get to know your characters and as you write it, and I'll get to that in a moment, but as you, as you get to know your characters, uh, the deeper they are psychologically and sociologically and even philosophically, the more conflict you get. And the more conflict you get is more of the action of the play, not just physical action, meaning you have characters do things on stage through physical movements, but also the action itself through the conflict between the characters. So you, you start to have these voices in your head and they're talk to each other and then if it's an interesting conversation between the two characters or more sometimes they have more than two characters speak in your head then what you wind up doing is you start to write it down and as you write down these characters what I do is um, I don't have really names after a while I have names for the characters as as they tend to begin to develop but I'll put down like A or B, A and B, or sometimes if I have three characters, A, B, and C, if I have four, A, B, C, and D, and so on. And then I'll just do A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B, all the way through the play. And now, as, as you start to write down these voices, so to speak, or this, this, um, this, this conversation that's in serious tension you have one character speak against the other character or maybe they'll speaking against an idea or someone else but there's always that conflict there's always a for and against going on and so as you write down the the conversation because it's you know plays are what 90 percent dialogue so as you write down the these conversations that you hear in your head you write them down and then as time goes by let's say maybe on your fifth fifth to tenth page you start to really see pretty much what you have and it's a kind of strange experience because you you're writing down what the characters are saying but you also are sort of an, you know i'm gonna just say this it's sort of like a, a third eye in a sense like a you also oversee what's going on. So as you write it down, you're also starting to realize what you have there on paper between the characters. So you start to move those characters. You can, even though pretty much they manipulate themselves to, around whatever is going on in the, in the initial writing of the play, but you also realize, hey, wait, hold it here, you know. This character is starting to uh, take on this way, or this character is taking on that way, and and then as you go by in the play, and like usually around like the twentieth page or so, then you realize you will either have a full length play or a one act play. Unless you start out with, I'm going to do only a one act, or I'm just going to do a, a twelve scene play, or I'm just going to do. A, uh, full length or whatever and years ago they used to have five act plays three act plays uh, Eugene O'Neill had a I think it was called Strange Interlude and you had to watch the performance over a period of like three or four days that's how long that play was okay um, but normally these days you have it only two act plays and they normally run on paper they normally run anywhere from 90 Maybe maybe eighty, but ninety to average wise ninety to one hundred and twenty pages usually on a two act play, um, and uh, these days theaters are sort of strapped with funds, so they prefer only like maybe two or three four characters max and simple sets and stuff like that. Unless you become well known. If you become well known, like Sam Shepard and those guys, then you can have elaborate type of uh, sets and characters and all this other stuff. But normally, actually, Sam Shepard only usually deals with a few characters. Sometimes he had 
some more than that, but usually, usually it's a few characters he deals with. But anyway, um, so as you go on to like the 20th page or so, you start to see what you have. And that sort of quote-unquote third eye starts to review the play, and, and you realize, okay, well, you know, I think I have a four-length play here. These guys are just going on, and I have enough tension. I'm dealing with a serious issue. And as you, so as you plot along, then you start to realize there's a plot. And then you can see if you're going to break down each act into scenes, or you're going to have two scenes in one act and two scenes in the other act, or you're going to have five and four or whatever. However, however it goes, and that usually is dictated by the characters, what they need, what they want, what they desire, what they long for, what they hate, what they love, you know, all this stuff. And so... As time goes by, let's say you're into the 40th or 50th page, by then you have a really good grasp of what you're dealing with. And usually around that period of time, maybe even before, before that, but usually around that time period of about the 40th, 50th page, uh, the theme starts to emerge. You start to realize, wait, hold it here. Oh, I see what's going on. And then you wind up, working now some people come up with titles even before they even write the play but how i normally write at least by you know by my history as far as what i've been how, how i've done it over the years is that as i get into about the middle of the play or about the 40th or 50th page then i'm starting to realize this is what it's about and then the title starts to emerge and not that I have one. It's usually what I have is, it's, I call it a working title. Most writers would call it a working title. So you have an idea, you have a focus as to where it's going. And then as you plot along, then you realize, oh, okay, this is the, that was the first act, and now I'm into the second act. So then the second act, you go through the obstacles and different conflicts and things like that. You might add a new new character into the play or whatever. And as you plot along, about the 90th to 100th page, you're at the point of saying, wait, hold it here, you know, okay, well, you know, I could have these characters speak for the next 2,000 years and have it about 17,000 pages here. Or um, I start to wind down on where that plot is going or I... I I, I got the premise, I understand the characters now, and now I'm going to wind it down and bring it to an end. And a, a really good play will leave the audience at the end of the play, when they leave the theater, to think about what, it's, what was it about through the title. And usually a play's title is very poetic, and it's in double meaning or triple meaning or multiple meaning. There's a lot of different layers to the title. And a, good, a really good play, you'll have those multiple meanings and those innuendos and those subtleties and the poetry throughout the play. Um, even though you're dealing maybe with maybe only one or two actual issues, you still have all those layers to it through your characters, the complexity of how, how well you develop your characters and that goes into the second act and so at the end of the play you, you finally bring down you, you know the, it peaks and then it comes down and you it resolves itself in its own way and then either it's a tragedy or it's a you realize comedy usually you have that pretty much in the beginning you realize this is tragedy or a comedy and some writers know the ending before they even start to play and some of them know it towards the beginning of the play. The way I have pretty much wrote my plays, it's not until about, let's say I'm doing a full-length play, it's not until about the 50th or to the 70th page that I realize, and let's say, let's say it's 120 pages. Usually I write 100 pages, but let's say it's 120, let's say, leave it at 100 pages. Let's say it's 100 pages. I, I know pretty much around the 50th, 60th, maybe 70th page, around in that area, that I know where the ending is going to go. And once you know the ending, once you have the ending down, then it ends. It's, it pretty much ends on its own. It's kind of strange because it, you're, it's working toward that end. 
either deliberately or you're doing unconsciously through the characters. And then you finally end the play. And then what happens is, what I usually do is I'll let it sit there in the drawer or on the shelf. Usually it's in the drawer. I'll let it sit there for, I don't know, about a month. But I'll think about it and things like that. And I'll maybe work on something else something else but usually I'll think about it and I'll do a little outlining and a little you know writing down some ideas and things like that and I'll wait about a month just let it sit there and then I'll go back to it and do a cold reading of it and almost try to act it out even though I'm not an actor I'll try to act it out the best I can and then what I do is and the hardest part when I used to write years ago I, and I used to send all my plays out in the 80s and um, in the 19, it's funny, in the 1980s, from 83 to not about 1990, I would write a first draft and just send it out thinking it was complete. <laughs> and it's not. It's uh, the craft of playwriting is when you actually go in there and start working on your drafts. Actually, as time went on, as, as me being a playwright or a writer, I realized that actually the interesting and the intriguing aspect of playwriting or any kind of writing for that matter but mainly for playwriting um is is going into those other drafts to be able to manipulate it because that's when you use your head and you're not so much um you're not controlled or manipulated so much by the characters. You're actually going in there and saying, okay, this, that works, that works, this doesn't work. And then you get to phrase the, the lines a certain way, the dialogue, you're able to phrase it, uh, the wording and stuff like that. And that's the craft. That's really the art of playwriting or any kind of art for that matter. And um, so when you go into the second draft... Uh, you're you're looking at it not really cold, but you're looking at it as objective as you can. And when I used to write plays, let's say if it was a hundred pages, you know, I I'd wind up adding more pages to it. And I always say that a really good playwright that's honest with uh, him or herself, or any writer for that matter, will actually take let's say a hundred and twenty pages and bring it down to about ninety or maybe even 85 pages, that you'll wind up eliminating more uh, of, the, of the dialogue in a play rather than adding to it. Because what you're doing is you're condensing that dialogue the best that you can. And, and what, through that brevity, you're actually making actually more conflict uh, through condensing that dialogue as much as you can. And the, and the more you condense it, and also leave it at full length, at least 80 pages or over. As long as you uh, leave it at that 80, between 80 to 120 pages long, but the, the, the key is to condense that dialogue as much as you can. And what it does is creates even more conflict within the play. That's the beauty of, of the second draft, at least uh, as far as my experience is concerned. And usually I will do another third draft. The third draft is going in there even more objectively and see what I can eliminate or how I can reconfigure figure these characters or the dialogue or the settings or the plot or whatever have you. And um, and always have that theme or the title by that, and also by I want to say in the second draft you have the title figured out by then. You know exactly what you're doing with the play. You know exactly the theme, the premise. You actually you know all the plot. You know the the the, the twists in the play. You know the characters very well. And actually in the third draft, that's when you get into even more depth as far as my own personal experience is concerned, you get into more depth of the character in the third draft. And you look at it more objectively and you realize, and you want to refine those characters as much as you can, also by making them have more depth, of course, but to refine them more. And and then also what I will do in the third draft is I'll put my, if I didn't have any, if I didn't have enough or I, I didn't have 
what should be in there in this in the second uh, in the first and second draft as far as actual f- physical action that is uh, physical movement on the on the stage like manipulating objects and stuff like that i will wind up putting that in the third draft i will do all of that i'll make sure that's complete so when the fourth draft comes along then that's all the fourth draft is to do all the typos and the fourth draft is just sort of an ongoing process until I get all the typos and all the lines right and the characters just right and I know the characters and they have, the, of course, they have their names by then and they have histories and stuff like that. And that's the fourth draft and that's just an ongoing process and that could, the fourth draft can take up to sometimes up to six months to complete because you're you're making sure that it's as perfect as you can you get all the the t's not as i's and all the s's not as o's and you know you you just make it so it's in in written form and as i say when you read a play you don't read it you listen to it a really good playwright um when they write words you're really listening to what it sounds like within that on on the page because that's what you're really doing outside of the visual aspect when the play play is actually put into production or development through either a cold reading or stage reading or through the workshops and then into uh you might even have a, a develop a developmental uh, play, or or then maybe even full production. Uh, uh, so anyway, um, the the point is is you want to have it so it's pretty much finalized. So when 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 it is ready to be produced, um, the visuals there for the audience, of course, but they're also listening. A lot of play writing or plays have to do with I would say oh I don't know um, unless they're experimental sometimes experimental plays might not even have any uh, sound to it could just be visual but normally I'm saying normally on the average it's very through the ear that the audience is listening to all those little tiny details that are being said by the characters or by even by special effects. Uh, the, the, even, you know, the funny thing, you know, you learn this, these two things I'm going to point out. One thing is just someone hits the door, knocks on the door. You know, it could be done in a certain way that adds effect to the actual characters and the play itself just by maybe knocking on someone's door you could either that knock can be aggressive or it could be sort of light-hearted or you know so you have a lot to do with not just the dialogue but also the physical actions itself as far as making the sounds that you listen to and the other thing that I've learned and I learned this mainly through um, Samuel Beckett and um, and uh, Sam Shepard, and especially Howard Pinter. Hopefully, I pronounce his last name P I N T E R. Especially through Howard Pinter, he really taught me. He taught me some, what I'm about to say next, and that is silence. The pauses and the beats between the words that are spoken. Actually, when when you have a dialogue and they're talking, and then all of a sudden there's silence. That silence actually is sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, of course, but sometimes those silences can be even more powerful than the dialogue itself or the special effects you may hear. That's how very careful silence is. And that pause there, however long it is, it doesn't matter if it's one second, if it's a half a beat, or even a quarter of a beat. And that usually depends on the director. They they will read the play and 
And actually, the director has a lot to do with the silences. Even though it's dic- it's notated in the in the play itself by the playwright, um, like if it says beat or it says pause or it says silence or whatever brief silence, the director has a lot of power what to do with those silences. Of course, the playwright. The, the great thing about playwriting is that, um, according to the Writers Guild, is uh, the director or anyone, the producer or anyone within theater itself cannot change words or dialogue or action or physical action or any of the play without the playwright's permission. A lot different than in Hollywood, they take a screen story or a screenplay and twist it inside out. Um, that's not like that in theater. In theater, the playwright is sort of boss, so to speak, unless the contract reads otherwise. And it, whatever contract you may get through your agent or through a lawyer or through uh, the theater or whatever have you. Um, but the director is the next component, and it's a very collaborative uh, process. So you have the playwright and the director usually works together. and But the, nevertheless, the director has a lot of power over those silences, over the dialogue, over the visuals, and everything. And usually... If the playwright and the director gets along, everything will be cool. If they don't get along, that player is going to have a fucked up experience. I promise you that. If the director and the playwright do not get along, there's a problem. And, you know, usually that's what, like, Samuel Beckett wound up doing, is he wound up directing a lot of his plays because he didn't like how people screwed around with his art. Just like Woody Allen in films, that's why he directs really 99% of his films because he didn't like the way people fucked around with his uh, with his films, with his directing his ideas and his, his, his characters and just twisting it inside out. I mean, even though it reads a certain way on the paper, it can be interpreted much differently by the director. And unless the playwright and the director are seeing eye to eye, you got problems. Now, in Hollywood, it's a whole different ballgame unless you're the director. The director is key to Hollywood. Now, um, the theater of playwriting, it's it's a, uh, it's a the playwright and the director. Even though the director gets just about maybe a half an inch more power than the playwright, because ultimately he has to direct the damn thing, okay? Unless the playwright's directing it him, him or herself. But... Um, normally, normally, how it works out is the director and the playwright will work together to get this play underway and produced. So, uh, the point I was saying was about the silences and silences and the pauses and the beats and the half beats, quarter beats, whatever. It's almost like a, like a music composition. You have to have that down really well and. Sometimes, like I say, sometimes a silence, just a complete standstill there of all the characters. And then, of course, you have the characters on stage and they're looking at each other. So the audience sees the visual between the two characters, but there's nothing said. That could, that could quote-unquote, sound even deeper or stronger and have a, a, even a bigger effect than all the dialogue in the entire play through those silences. So, silences have a lot to do with um, theater. Has a lot to do with theater. I think the only one that really got silences down in film was Igmar Bergman. He was really great at silences. Same with the other gentleman. I saw all all his films. Um, Can't pronounce it. Um, B-E-L-A is his first name. His last name is T-A-R-R. He, oh man, his... Like you got to see his films. I mean, his you talk about silences, and then his films are su- seriously long. It once took me seven hours to watch one of his movies. I mean, it's just huge, just huge. But he he deals with a lot of silences. Igmar Bergman did that, and then of course um, Woody Allen did some of that because uh, his uh, he was inspired by Igmar Igmar Bergman a lot. Uh, like he did the um, in, uh, interiors 
And um, what was the other one? I think it was September. He did he did a, um, a couple that two or three that were ha had those silences in there in the, in the, in the movie, in the film. But anyway, theater is a lot of, to do with the silences, believe it or not, than any format um, in the arts. But so that's that, and so that's the fourth draft. And I don't want to make this play uh, this play this uh, this um, video too long. But anyway, so that that so the fourth draft, you pretty much um, make sure you polish it is what you do. You you make sure all the things just right. And then finally, after you're done that, and that's an ongoing process. It takes a good six months or so, to, five, six months to get that down right. And then that goes, and then what I'll do is just take that shelf it for, I don't know, for however long I want. It could be two weeks, could be six months even. I, you know, it depends on the play. And then I take it, and then I type it completely out for word for word and I don't change it I don't change it and I say to myself look you know either it's going to stand up on its own or it's going to never um, be accepted you you send it out uh, to, to certain theaters or workshops or whatever uh, developmental workshops um, who accept uh, unsolicited um, uh, plays and and then hopefully uh, they'll like it or they're interested or they might or you might just send ten pages, and then they want it, they they find it interesting, and they want to see the rest of the play or things like that. But when you do, at least the way I write, my style of writing is it, it, the fifth draft is it. So I don't touch it after that, regardless of uh, if uh, a theater says, you know, this would really be a cool play if you did it this way. Uh, no, unless now if I. Um, once I get it into the workshops and have it start to be workshop, then yes, of course, I will try to work out a scene this way or try to work it out. But until it's accepted to be actually developed or produced, I don't, I don't touch it. I just leave it alone and I just shelf it. I have the plays up there in the closet there. I just sh put them on the shelf and leave them there. And once in a while, I'll take them out and take a look at, at them. And um, and read it, and I'll say, oh, that's interesting, you know, whatever, you know, because it's very cold by then, especially some of the plays I wrote years ago. When I when I read them, it's very cold. It's like, I can't believe I wrote that, you know, or whatever, you know, that's interesting, or whatever, you know. So that's my process of of writing or the mechanics of playwriting, and everyone has their own style, and you learn that as time goes by, as you learn your the craft itself and the, and the craft itself is from the second draft onward the first draft and and i'll tell you anyone i don't care who you are uh, anyone can write a play anyone anyone can but it's when you get into the second draft is when the craft of playwriting kicks into place and then you have to you have to learn how to how to work up you know just just the visuals, let alone forget about the dialogue. Just the visuals, you know, of shadowing and you know, um, just lighting effects and uh, and um, what the set looks like and uh, just add entrances and exits and and all kinds of uh, you know, as far as the um, the dresses or the wigs or you know whatever I have the makeup or what the person looks like and things like that. So. There's a lot to do with it because you're actually dealing with actual humans, so to speak, you know, and you're actually dealing with characters. So the main thing I want to uh, bring across is if you have two characters at conflict, that will create the action in the play to, to take it throughout. The, that action will go will go f through the play. It will that action will take the play. It's hard to say, but. Well, that action will take the play forward to the and you'll go through all the plots until you get to the end and then like I said before your theme or your title will have been complete by that time so you're bringing the audience on a journey through your play 
So by the end, when they leave the theater, they'll say, oh, so that, I'll tell you, that's interesting, yeah. So anyway, that that's pretty much my... Uh, my uh, take on playwriting. Like I said, I'm not a professional playwright, and I, I've never, I've been, I've had, let's see, yeah, I've had three, three, uh, one act, one acts uh, produced, but I've never had a full length play produced, and maybe someday I will. I don't know, you know. Um, it's not so much. I don't think it's. Um, I don't think that my full-length plays aren't producible. I just, I deal with serious issues. And so, and I deal with very different types of issues. And theaters tend to, sometimes for the for the season, for the year yearly season at the theater, they might have themes that they're doing, or each theater has their own way of dealing with certain issues and how they want their audiences that come to that particular theater or only looking for for certain plays for certain times and so there's that's when the politics the administrative as, aspect of playwriting kicks into play and you might have written a, a brilliant play there's plenty of playwrights have written brilliant plays that you know, only maybe after their death years later you say oh man this this guy was really freaking great you know or just that it's not right for that particular theater, and they pass up on it, even though it could be a great play. So it depends on the theater and the politics and the administrative aspect of it, as far as how they want to uh, operate their uh, theater administratively, what their own ideas for the season are, what the, what their aim is, and what their, how their audiences are, and all this other stuff that goes along with it which has absolutely nothing to do with the play itself. That has to do with the theater itself. And so hopefully you'll get a full-length play produced, if not, at least try to get a one-act play produced. And they even have, um, what was this play? Oh, I can't remember what's called, Louisville Theater Company or something like that. It's in Louisville. Oh, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, but anyway, um, and I used to have this thing that they unfortunately ended they don't have any they don't print any more new ones but probably because not many theaters are accepting unsolicited plays but it used to be called um, the dramatist uh, source book and uh, anyway in Louisville um, it's Louisville theater I can't remember Anyway, they would have uh, even 10-page uh, plays uh, that they would perform. And then there is, and I remember in La Mama um, Experimental Theater Theater in New York City, they even had one-page plays. <laughs> I mean, some of Samuel Beckett's plays are extremely short, extremely short. So it depends on, um, you know, the play itself and what you want to do with the play. So, anyway, this is my take on um, playwriting, and um, like I say, you know, just, you know, sit down, write a play, you know, and like I say, anybody can write a play, you know, and then after that, see what you have, work on it, craft it, and then if you get enough, you know, gumption in you to say, ah, what the hell, then send it out and see if it gets accepted or not, you know. And then uh, maybe you'll get an agent before I ever do. <laughs> and there's a lot of good books on uh, playwriting and things like that uh, to read. But really where it's at is, is to read other playwrights' stuff. The the ones uh, like Sam Shepard or uh, Eugene. I can't, I can't do his last name. Eugene uh, I-O-N-E-S-C-O. He's a French playwright. I like a lot of French playwrights. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say real quick some of these French playwrights that I've been inspired by, and and I, I've ins been inspired, and um, I've read all their plays. Uh, Alfred Jerry, um, Alfred uh, J A R R Y, 
um, Antonin Artor. I know I'm not pronouncing these last names, but just deal with me. A Antonin A-R-T-A-U-D. Um, see what else? Uh, of course, Sam Shepard. Um, I actually read his plays back in the 80s. I mean, I love Sam Shepard. Oh, he was great. His old stuff I'm talking about. Um, and then uh, Samuel Beckett. And um, who else did? Um, oh man! And you know what's a really, really good book to read if you're into experimental stuff is a Theater of the Absurd by um, Martin Eslin. E S S L I N. He's really good. That that's a great book, Theater of the Absurd. And there's many books out there that you, you can read to, to get a really good idea of what it is all about, the theater itself, let alone the the process of writing. So anyway, uh, that is my take on the mechanics of playwriting, and you guys have a great day.